on to the fiction. As always, I hope that you enjoy. A quick thank you to the T5 peeps. Bob the Dragon, Data Magnet, Cat Crab Lobster, Dark Machine, Try Again 95, Astray the Dreamer, Mezik, Feudic Joel, German Chemist, Casper Arnholtz, and Chaos to Must. Thank you very much. Chapter 139 Angelic The best way to tackle something was to take it one step at a time. So Delta did that. She had an ample time to choose her next floor, confident that she'd have a choice before long. First order of business is... Delta pointed to a simple door to the north. The bus, she said, and it was like the entire floor tensed in excitement. Like all boss rooms, it was simply empty round room, waiting for Delta to mold it into something. First floor, Bran and Bacon. They offer direct combat and a sort of give-it-your-all vibe. Delta mused aloud as she paced back and forth, finding it soothing to just be a dungeon for a moment. Make a room, fill the room, use the room, then move on to the next room. Second floor has Wyan, who is about challenging you after long trials and purposely being antagonistic towards adventurers and kidnapping one of them to cause panic. Delta held up the other hand. So, her third boss should be something either tricky, gimmicky, or minion-using if she was going to keep things fresh. She pursed her lips. Nor, um, all of those, she said slyly, and pulling up her menus to go through them in search of important items. After a moment, she had a simple iron cauldron over the flames as she began to drop things in. One dragon skull, a gut rot, a lich bone or two, and to make them cook so lovely... Delta held her hands up, and a jug appeared before she poured a thick goop into the pot. Troll soup, she said with a grin. After a moment, nothing happened. Delta frowned before she went to the library and returned with a spare copy of Hungry Caterpillar. I forgot some good taste, she amended as she dropped the book in. The cauldron began to shake and shoot sparks into the air. Delta took three steps back, hands clasped together. Come on, show me the horrors I made, she beckoned. Xiu Cho knew who was a lever. The pot exploded. I mean, we have a job. We can't exactly just ask for a promotion, Dragon said gruffly. Bickard, counter doctor, interested in what his boss form would be. Then opened his mouth, but an enormous explosion rocked the third floor, and a terrible presence soon filled the boss room. On oh, second thought, I'm happy staying out here, Doza announced quickly. I heard the sound of chaos, Dr. Sang, and tried to glide towards the boss room, but was held back by Van. Best uh, to wait until Delta screams or complains. Uh, then we'll know, he said gruffly, his muscles flexing as he crossed his arms. Know what? Dragon asked as he snorted out flames. If our minds can handle what lies within, Van responded quietly. They all waited. Delta coughed, clearing the smoke from her vision as she looked to see what she'd made. On the ground in front of her, lurs a tiny draconian skull with two curly horns. Delta stared at the tiny skull. The skull stared back, empty eye sockets without expression. You're going to do something the moment I look away and drop my guard, she accused, and inside one of the eyes, a little green grub emerged, more slime than bug. It yawned, with black floating material inside forming its little beady eyes. Delta bent down. I was trying to make a giant wave of bone and slime that would be a threat unless they did the right trick, she admitted. The little slime eyed her and opened its mouth to reveal four little stubby nubs in each corner of its mouth. That could have been teeth. I don't believe you, Delta said with a smile, and the creature blinked then smiled with a happy gargle. She pulled up his notification. You have created Jalagan, a creature made with powerful necrotic energies and a habit of snacking on expensive things. As a potential boss, it is weak now. But if made with boss, it gains a strong effect. Make boss. Delta thought about it, and the grub made its black eyes enlarge pathetically. Oh, all right, she said as if she were ever going to say no. Her bosses weren't really about being bosses. They were about bringing the floor together, and the sky was great. Make boss, she announced, and booped the grub's face, making a gargle with delight. All that seemed to happen was on its dragon skull. 
a little golden crown appeared, making the grub applaud with delight. Her field was abruptly filled with screens, and she barely had time to read them before another one appeared. Jelligan has become King Jelligan, the third floor boss. Jelligan is a happy creature that is usually easy to defeat. However, the more adventurers take from the floor, the stronger he becomes. If an adventure overeats at the feast hall, Jelligan grows larger. If an adventurer takes from the mushroom tunnel, he develops stronger acid and mushroom powers. If an adventurer steals from the runelic blacksmith at his forge, his skull becomes a body. If the adventurer takes or destroys things in the lab, Jelligan can produce Prince Jelly and Princess Jellica slimes as minions. If anyone drinks from the manor well without permission, Jelligan becomes the Dark King Jelligan. If anyone steals from Jeb's kitchen, Jelligan can produce skeletal pygmy mushroom minions. If books are taken from the library without permission, Jelligan can invite Libro into the boss room at the back of the adventurers. If the trolls and or all the gargoyles are destroyed, Jelligan can summon royal slime knight and troll soup slimes. If both are destroyed, can summon both types as minions. If every previous bonus is activated, Jelligan can go from Dark King Jelligan to Overlord Jelligan. Delta read this over a few times, her smile growing as she read. I wonder what happens if I add ten more things for people to take. She mused before picking Jelligan up and holding his skull to her body. Who's a cute destroyer of gluttony and greed, she said, and the little worm slime cheered. She was smiling as she was so simple and fun. No liches, no war, no pressing doom, just good old Dutch and fun. Now your room must be befitting a king of your stature, she announced grandly, and Jelligan warbled in agreement. You know, she began, walking forwards with a boss in her arms, I just got this thrown off this brat, she said brightly. She began to weave the room around her like a canvas and her hand as a brush. Her joy was the paint. Hit me, Maharia mumbled. Farah eyed the fairy before pouring yet another hot milk, sliding it across the counter into Maharia's open hand. How today? Farah asked acidly. Funny, I get it. I'm a horrible fairy lit you should suffer because I dared upset Mummy Delta. Maharia groaned as she sipped her milk. Nah, we can forgive whatever you had done before becoming dungeon. It's a fact that you kept going after Delta, let you live. That annoys us, Farah said bluntly. Maybe I didn't want to live. How about that? Maharia snapped, and she turned her dark glare on Farah, trying to conjure dark power, only to be facing down some massive twin barrel fire crystal pole gun. One reason. Just give me one reason, and unlike the self-absorbed rocking chair called Wyan, I'll actually do more than play, Ferris snarled. They stared at each other. Maharia backed off. I don't get why I'm here, Maharia finally admitted and drained a milk. Vera had a fresh one waiting for her. Punishment, prisoner of war, redemption, maybe something else. You're expecting to be able to get into Delta's head, and that's where you're screwing up. Delta can be directed or even shifted, but Delta cannot be stopped. Vera leaned in and her frame was powerful. She's too nice, so she has to us to lay down the truth. None of us get enough time with her. We all want to know more, ask more, be more. But Delta is one person and we are many. You cannot ask the sun to shine on you alone, Vera said quietly and walked off. So, am I to wait here just to hope for the best? Maharia asked, scoffing slightly. Get a hobby, or bother new. It works for the rest of us, Ferris said as she vanished through the back of a bar. Maharia glanced at the door and floated up. Perhaps you're right. I should do something. Maharia agreed and shot off flying through the first and the second floor so fast there was a blur, edging around Wyam, who looked savage and delighted Maharia's reaction. The fairy powered on, and before long she was inside the room beyond the garden, ready to speak to Delta, to demand the sun look at her for a moment. Delta was busy shaping the room and the floor to resemble some rather basic throne room of sorts. Maria opened her mouth, but the skull resting on Delta's shoulder turned and the creature within looked at her. 
and Maharia suddenly couldn't breathe. It felt like the air had turned heavy and was on fire. The skull seemed to grow to Maharia, the slime inside becoming less of a worm and more of a wyrum. It rose above her, and its black eyes ignited in sickly yellow flames as the skull filled and cracked. It stared down at her with a long serpentine body, dripping with more potent necromantic energies than even Maharia once possessed. Delta turned around, and the skull was just a skull, the image of the dangerous being gone like a mirage that had wandered too close to. Maharia, Delta said, surprised at the sight of her. Can, can, I, can we talk? Maharia asked, feeling like her fake flesh had turned ghostly white. Delta eyed the room with a frown as if she had been enjoying herself, then nodded. I could use a break, uh, from my break. She joked and then put the hellish beast let it die down on the ground, promising that she'd be back after a quick coffee break. Let me show you to my favorite place, Delta said, and Maharia would agree to go back to the troll pot if it meant getting away from the wine of this thing. Delta's bosses were the stuff of nightmares. Alpha had gone to the moon. That was an experience. Now he was back in Durance, and arguably a stranger place. He walked past people that felt completely outclassed by. Monsters walking around like normal villagers, pretending to barter or enjoying the act of town gossip. They had carved a life here, but it felt like a stage prop at times. Like they were waiting for the curtain to rise and the show to begin. And Alpha would soon become one of them. The idea didn't scare Alpha as much as it used to. He'd camp outside Delta's dungeon if need be, but he was glad to be nearby. He pondered the idea of being in contact with her, but apparently the idea unsettled people. Contracted humans had a stigma attached to them from what Alpha had heard anyway. As he walked down the street, he was stopped by a voice that he had learned to fear. I wonder where he ran off to, Al. Her howl's voice sounded out as she emerged from the tavern, looking peckish. Her howl was looking peckish. It was when she was starving that Alpha didn't dare get near. I, um, I was exploring, he said simply, deciding that he wasn't lying. Explored the dungeon, found family, lost his soul to a demonic lich girl, got rescued, was present for the meeting between two gods from his nightmares, left for a snack, he didn't skip too much, honestly. Come on, you're sticking by me. I'm heading back to report that the town is uh, functional as a new base of operation for the king's little men, Paul said brightly, as if the idea of those little men was a snack that she could pick up on the way home. Less than 24 hours ago, Alpha would have snapped to attention, accepting the request without a word. But he didn't. No. A request? No. Her order. Alpha didn't care for it. I quit the nights and being your squire. I'll be staying here, Alpha announced, and he felt almost pain at seeing the words quest fail appear. But Delta's face appeared in his mind, and he powered on, only shaking slightly. What was that, Al? Prowl asked, confused, perfectly innocent with her expression. I quit, he repeated, a cascade of quest failed notifications appearing and his requests built in his time in the capital were abruptly cut off. He trembled, feeling like a failure. He held on to the lingering touches of Delta's manner. It felt safe, like an old hand that used to promise him safety and made it happen. Sure, you can quit, Bohol shrugged and leaned down. I just need your hand to sign the papers back home. You don't mind if I just take one? She asked brightly and drooled to escape the corner of her mouth at the idea. Alpha backed up, unable to stop feeling afraid. Bohol's frame seemed to be rippling like her skin was a suit she wore. Al, you always look the most scared. Grumptious out of the squires. It's why I wanted you as mine, she explained. Someone stepped between them. Exc um, excuse me, a soft voice interrupted. Alpha looked to see a familiar red hair and the boy they met in Delta's dungeon. Dio. 
Miss, I advise you to step back and not eat my friend, Dio said bravely. Although, looking around, wondering if he missed another one of the teens from before, or Kemi. He didn't see anyone, or wondered if Dio's friend was a level 99 stealth skill. Impressive. And what a cute little strawberry you are. A hull giggled like she was a schoolgirl and bent down, drooling obscenely now. I could call you right up, she promised. Ma'am, <clears throat> ma'am. I think eating people has been illegal since five years ago, after Mr. Vaughn got cranky, Dio admitted, before turning and smiling at Alpha. And you can't eat me. We only just became friends. I haven't had time to invite him to dinner or play heroes and more heroes, he explained. Wait, did Dio mean Alpha was his friend? He checked his mental notifications. He hadn't gotten a party invite, a request... You two are like cream and strawberries. Just the perfect match. A little bite of each has all I need and you can go home. The large knight said and took Dio's arm. Alpha didn't know exactly what happened next, but his sensory skills went insane. The world went so quiet that his own heartbeat hurt to hear. It thumped louder and louder, the sound overpowering. He breathed, and the sensation of his lungs inflating was torturous. There was a new sound. Someone stepping on cobbled stones, and the sound was like crashing waves or cannon fire. But however bad it was for Alpha, Bahal was on the ground, skin tearing, ears leaking fluids, and eyes expanding. Dio winced, but didn't look to be harmed. A beautiful woman, who bore a striking resemblance to Dio, appeared and looked down at the royal knight with disdain. If it was too quiet before, it was like the world completely stilled around the woman as she seemed to eye Alpha before the effect she had over him faded to a bearable level. She bent down, looking the snarling poor hole in the face. When she spoke, it was like a primordial bang in the space, bringing light don't. A single word, and the street shattered, Baal's royal knight armor cracking as the woman was pushed back hard enough that her bones began to fracture. The sound returned to the world with an almost simple pop. Baal was still unmoving as her hair was splayed out and away from her, her slowly healing skin raw. Dio, do you want sweet potatoes or carrots? The woman asked. Boy, sweet, Dio eyed the fallen knight with a frown, but looked like he was thinking hard, and then eyed Alpha. Do you like carrots? he asked. The woman eyed Alpha with a wary look, but offered him a small smile after a moment. Alpha liked carrots. Well, whatever you like, he said in shock. Let's get both, Dio suggested. His mother nodded with a smile, looking tearful at his son and his ability to hear her. Then Alpha was dragged away by the two for an unexpected dinner. His resignation from the Royal Knights didn't go with a whimper, but that was definitely not a bang. Delta, what have you got me involved with? He mentally asked. This isn't my fault, Delta mentally grimaced, trying to not let it show. At the bottom of the lake, Moharia and Delta sat in a very strained silence as they avoided each other's gaze. I didn't start this war or this conversation, she added, and Maharia sighed. What's that? she asked, pointing to something, but sounding like she wasn't bothered if it was answered. The air bubbled around her head, that Delta made let her speak clearly. Delta followed her gaze to see the bouncing googly eyes of a very obvious sunken treasure chest. It's a trick mimic. People think that it's a trap because inside is a rare key to all the doors in the dungeon, she said, and Maharia floated over and kicked it with interest. A second later, and there was nothing but bubbles in the lake as the calamity swallowed Maharia, the itch large tongue sticking out at the side of its body. I hate you, came Maharia's muffled voice. Dalja gestured for the clam to release Maharia, and it spat her out with a grin. Let's talk, because you're bumming me out, Dalja said, and Maharia looked pissed. I'm bumming you out. You enslaved me. She reminded Delta, as if the core could forget. 
You tried to kill me, eat my friends, then turn me insane. I win, Delta said flatly. Just tell me what you want so we can end this charade. Clearly, neither of us is happy about it, Maharia said, smoothing down a small dress and folding her wings behind her to let her float in the water. You agreed to this, and I've got so much going on that yes, I'm sorry that you feel enslaved and forgotten about, but I really do not stop working. Delta sighed as she eyed the fake moon. It was funny how she always ended up back here. Maharia went on about how she felt like a joke or like she was just around as a punching bag. But Alta wasn't listening for the moment. She just had an idea. Usually this only worked with New, but Maharia could also fill the same role. Rhea, I have a plan, Delta said. Maharia stopped abruptly, mouth open. I beg your pardon? I will not have my... She began, but Delta grabbed her and shot into the air, taking the ferry with her. Delta zoomed in her very first room beyond her entrance. Oh, spiderwebs, that didn't get old after the first ten years down here, Aria said sarcastically as she tried to fix her hair. Shh, it's a good time. You were a princess, right? Delta asked, and Maharia paused before nodding slowly. The middle child of three, but yes, she muttered, and after a second a spider court emerged, reformed from the time as the symphony of nightmares. They all perched on webs, beginning the three-hour-long dance of greeting. Behind them, two more shapes lowered themselves into the room from above. The ghostly form of Muffet moved with an elegance and ethereal grace. Qui was less elegant, more of an awkward teen trying to dance down the web. Delta responded with a, I'd love to talk but must cut the greeting short, counter-dance, so this to not simply be rude. It involved a lot of squatting and flailing. No, mighty spiders, I bring you a noble annoyance from the fallen kingdom. Her attitude makes her molting awkward, and her manners make poor webs, she said. And Maharia turned slowly to glare at Delta. Muffet twisted, making elegant gestures of such lyrical poetry that it would bring tears to the eight eyes of any spider that saw it. Kui crossed his human arms and glared at Maharia, who was staring at his very pretty features with shyness before she looked away, angry at herself. Delta translated the beauty of spider word into a less pretty English. What do you wish for us to do with the rude bony one? She needs a place to be a catty little rude thing, but in a way that she can pass it off as charming. She needs politics, Delta said easily. I am not sure that spiders can provide such means. Maharia scoffed, and one of the spiders touched her wings before shaking its head. Two more shared whispers behind their legs. Kui puffed up his chest. Your cheekbones are quite high, he said smugly. Maria stared at him before she clung to Delta. You can't leave me here, she commanded a little desperately. Delta calmly took her and placed her on a nearby web, sticking her in place. Now swing by later. The spiders are the most unbiased of my monsters if you observe their rules. Just work your way in and keep your cool head. You'll be popular in no time, she promised fudging the truth just a tad. Popular was overselling it. How many rules? Maria asked, her cherubic face pinched as she waved her hands. Well, uh, you just broke four there and insulted someone's third leg in the same motions. So watch that, Delta replied brightly. Muffet placed an elegant web hat on Maharia's head. Look, you've been given the forgive this one for her actions in future tidings, as her knowledge is that of an unborn hat. Delta exclaimed excitedly as the floppy hat settled on the lich fairy's head. Maharia eyed the hat. It's a nice hat, she had to admit, after being stuck with the same clothes for the last hundred years. I shall instruct you as we have mostly similar arms and hands, Kui said briskly, walking forward, long hair flowing. Maharia went quiet. Okay, she finally said shrinking into her hat to avoid being seen. Delta eyed this with amusement. Ah, undeveloped mental personalities that got stuck at the mental age of early teens for a century. So easily flustered. Delta should have sent a dozen handsome spider boys at Maharia, not hulking monstrosities. Hindsight was funny like that. End of chapter. Chapter 140 Dancing Queen. Jalligan, do you want to blush red or silky purple? 
Doubter asked as she conned a soft pillow on the throat, the skull on the floor moving with the pace of the slow slug, goggled something out. Green cotton, Delta used, switching it up so the pillow was set into the throne. The entire image was to be more of a symbol than the usual imposing sight of power to anyone walking in. Ran made an entrance. Wyan put on a show. Delta wanted a little jelligan to make a statement. The throne itself was a little shabby looking with only a cheap looking banners about it. It was long and rectangular with stained glass set into the walls, showing off various scenes of the dungeon. A hot spot under a full moon with Luna, a party in Hogshead with Vera, Wyan at dusk, and even Lord Mushi fast asleep atop a nonplussed sheep. With someone who went about the third floor with grace, able to act like a sensible people, this room would be what they saw. A simplistic stone room with bright chandeliers and candles set into the bumblebee candle holders, and a snack table with some empty bowls that Delta would soon fill. Chairs surrounded the table and a teapot bubbled away. King Jelligan's humble throne room. Bowls filled with rare treats from across the dungeon. King Jelligan lets them pass without a fight. Delta hummed and mentally flipped the switch, shifting the room so it grew larger. The stone turning to a darker gray. The bumblebee candle holders became glaring wasps as the table and chairs vanished. The humble throne pressed into the back of the room, the top of it spreading up like a creeping vines of metal. The metal, turned from brass to a stained glass images, changed to show Luna rising out of a spa with a knife. Vera's pub dark except her eyes and the glow of a boomstick. Why I'm turning to the viewer, smiling. Lord Mushy was sitting up now, frowning. There were two new windows. One showed Maestro leaning on his cane with a wicked smile, and the last of Fran riding bacon emerging from the darkness of his room. King Jelligan displeased throne room. King Jelligan grows stronger and fights. The windows occasionally let loose abilities based on their images. And finally, Delta flipped the switch once more. The stone turned utterly black, glowing red lions moving between each block like a pulsing veins leading to the throne, which was made of some crimson metal. Its height spanned the massive hall, arcing out into two giant metallic wings and snarling dragon head as the seat itself was massive, able to fit three adult males side by side. The chandeliers blazed out of control, burning and warping the air, dripping black wax every few seconds like an angry rain. The candle holders were now full-sized gargoyles, ready to spring to life when Jelligan needed them the most. The stained glass windows were no longer able to smash since the dark holes in reality were in their place, occasionally letting a shadow clone of one of Delta's various monsters appear to attack, their forms smoky with glowing eyes. Two more had joined the fight, a furious hero with a cap on his power, and Bob the Worm. Oh, looks nasty, Delta said with respect as Jelligan goggled with pleasure at the sight of it. King Jelligan's furious throne room. Jelligan becomes almost full strength. Minions fall, slimes from the melting wax and gargoyles. Shadow monsters aid Jelligan. There was another switch to the room, but it required a password just to be safe. You Jenny, Delta called out, and the room shuddered. The stone and walls broke apart, teetering on the edge of the dungeon, and the warped space that allowed it to be massive without being constrained to simple layers. A purple void stretched out between the floating platforms as the throne rose, breaking apart, forming a metallic dragon armor that Jelligan would equip as his full form, becoming the throne itself. The armor was so big it had to rise above the platforms, leaving its legs and tail below. Storms crackled overhead dramatically, and horrid winds blew across the void. The shadowy beings that had been pretty much a feature so far gathered into massive blade that occasionally bulged with forms of past monsters. Feels a very final boss, Dalton managed to get out without choking. Jelligan, thankfully, still in his baby form, cooed at the sight of the power he wielded. Overlord Jelligan's oblivion throne, Jelligan is done.
Falling into the void removes someone from the dungeon. The Shadow Blade can use moves from the past bosses or combine them. Violent Storm buffets invaders. Maestro provides dark Latin choir music waiting in the background along with electric guitar riffs. Do you think this is too much? Delta asked Jelligan, who made a soft oh no ever motion with a shake of his head. Maestro let loose on his rock music and does the conjure lighter as a damn guitar which just so roughy. Destroy all death, Maestro chanted with his best impression of JRPG Latin. Destroy all life, he went on. Well, thank goodness mushrooms didn't bother with such things as that. The woman, Esanella, sang, and she waited with sheer joy as Dio turned to her. Ah, ah, he sang back, and Alpha was a little awestruck by how beautiful they made each basic note sound as they sang to each other. Humph, <clears throat> Dio's father mumbled, and the floor shook. This family was singing to each other like they hadn't actually seen each other in years. Alpha felt like an intruder, but every time he tried to flee out the window or teleport, Isanella appeared and gave him food. Damn social etiquette. Alpha knew that they were one of the many weaknesses, like social skills, talking to people, and necromantic liches stealing his soul. Miss D would chap him his hide if she caught him being rude to nice people. He paused between bites of some homemade cookie as the thought went through his mind. Miss D? He was getting stuffed onto too much good food. Nalta would be upset if he was rude to her neighbors. You sing, Dalta insisted, leaning in with a grin. Alpha put down his napkin. No, I don't sing, he said without apology. And all three of them looked at him with shock. Damaged cords, Asinella mumbled a sweet sound even when she was muttering. Cursed, Dio's father eyed Alpha with concern. Shy, Dio exclaimed, voice rising a bit in horror. All three, I should get going. Alpha tried to get up, but hesitated when Esanella put a hand on his shoulder. I had words with the innkeeper. She's odd, but due to the unique circumstances of your arrival, you have a room there for however long you need. It's only a small room, she trailed off. And Alpha frowned. I don't have a reward for your work, he pointed out, and she looked amused. Then sing for me. She teased and Alpha felt stuck by his own logic. He had to reward her. She did a quest for him even without him knowing it. Um, okay, he said slowly. ABC, he hummed out, feeling like a total idiot. His nana took his hand and spun him around. D E F. She carried on as if you were creating some masterpiece. Alpha flushed, so distracted by the sheer enjoyment the family got from singing the song that he didn't even notice the pattern when it swung back to his turn. He had been musically shanghaied. Delta better send a disaster for him to address, or Alpha was gonna die. Delta was sure she was missing something, but after returning to the bathroom back to normal, she checked the upgrades and only read the first two before she slammed the menu shut. Allow Jelligan's greed punishment to affect the fur. Allow Jelligan's greed punishment to affect the sick. That's enough scary stuff for one room, she laughed nervously as Jelligan settled on his humble throne, falling asleep on his pillow, a large green bubble expanding from his face and deflating as he snored. Besides, the rest of the floor needed loving. It was far from done, and the sheer amount of upgrades also meant that the second floor could finally reach its peak. There was a sense, a dungeon sense, when the floor reached the sort of perfect balance that any more large upgrades would be a disservice to her other floors. Obviously, Dalza would still improve the first floor like the pond room and more, but it was just the way she liked it. The second floor was close to that, but it needed a lot of changes to be closer to peak. She floated out the main garden and decided to do something obvious. She marked Jelligan's door with a massive set of double steel doors on it, the earth shaping over it to form a dragon-like maw with the door in its throat. Belta added torches into the sunken eyes to make them glow. Now, there was no doubt which was the boss, which suited Delta just fine. If she knew people, and Alta was pretty sure that she was still a human being deep down, then the idea of not exploring for loot would kill certain people. It was a rule of explorers, 
If you found the correct path on the first try, backtrack and go the other way. It did raise a potential future issue where people just ignored the third floor and rushed past Jellygan, but she could devise some conditional lock based on the floor later. Information was going to spread by word of mouth from adventurer to adventurer. Delta couldn't stop and she wouldn't have the DP and mana to constantly change every room or floor every time someone visited. It would trap Delta in a loop of actually making no progress. She decided to start where she always ended up. Delta would start with the mushrooms. She floated into the tunnel that once contained a massive hole that likely connected to the other castles of silence. Delta could have kept it open and thrown insults down it, but the thing was creepy if she was honest. Now, glowing orange mushrooms grew everywhere. The caps cracked and glowing veins of their roots caused ominous light to emerge from out the ground. The air inside the tunnel shimmered and Dalton noticed one mushroom. Likely, the first one that grew was larger than the others. What should I do here? What should I do to make things fit into the aesthetic of the floor? She asked aloud. The theme was a castle and a garden, really. With a built-in demon blacksmith. Every castle had one demon smith, right? She mentally went over what she had said. A library, a feastal, a romantic garden with terrifying gargoyles. An evil laboratory that would need to be converted. A blacksmith, a troll, then a kitchen, a mop room, and a uh, throne. The idea hit her when she imagined what she would want in her castle if she was a princess. Dalta would have to admit that she was hitting queen status, not princess soon, but not today. She rubbed her hands excitedly as she stretched the room out massively, making it almost as big as the garden and beast hall using up some DP to really push it to where she wanted. With a wave of her hand, she began to shift mushrooms around, feeding them manna until they grew truly massive. It had themes of the mushroom grove, but she quickly put that to rest by focusing on the floor. With stuff she absorbed on Maharia's castle, she watched as cream marble formed like liquid being poured until it settled into a gleaming floor. Delta gave it a few experimental taps before she grinned putting up her sleeves to get down to the fun stuff. The large lava shrooms narrowed, becoming thinner and also covered in marble, causing their heat to form into stone, forming orange veins like glowing ivy. Occasionally, flashes of heat rose, causing them to have a soft strobe effect before the heat spread across the ceiling where Delta created elegant paths for the light to pass through, forming her own magic artwork of the ceiling. Hmm... Delta coughed, looking around to make sure that she was alone before she manually took control of the manor and the pillars. The heat inside the pillars began to pulsate in ever-increasing rates before the surface of the pillar became covered in various colored glass, causing the expanding space to flash with an intense pumping bass and colors. Oons, 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 Delta said, moving around like she had a ragdoll physics on. She paused, beating eyes on her. She turned to see the gargoyles and Jellican watching her. I see you're developing sonic attacks, Doctor said good-naturedly as the sound ceased. It's music, Dalta counted, crossing her arms. It's intense, Dragon replied, his lips pulled back into a grin. It's meant to be blood-rushing, she added, feeling defensive of her early 2000s rave music. A screen appeared before anyone else could make a smart remark to force Delta to seem more insecure about her fading. You have, have developed, developed a room to become a hot-blooded ballroom, except change. Delta grinned and headed without thinking. The entire room began to shake as the walls and pillars warped, stretching further. From the very top, a chandelier much grander than Jelligan had in his throne room appeared like a molten gold. All the lights were made of fire and water crystals their lights pulsating to form a soft, shimmering lilac color over the room. Nearby, a wall pulled in on itself, forming a grand stage where a band could play, but at the top of the marble steps, a platform rode, showing Maestro's form as he was lowered down, his majestic cane propping him up as he leaned on it sideways, hat dipping down. The shaking did not stop, and Dalta threw herself to the ground in hopes of avoiding blame, if new came looking, Ah, a panic in the ballroom, Maestro declared grandly as the top of the room had various spaces, 
Arch observation windows for people to sit appeared, each of them having a personal sign. Belter could not quite give them a decent look over as the shaking hit some sort of crescendo. A double set of doors formed around the far side and felt like it stretched and looped elegantly to the surface, connecting to her entrance hall. From the first window, a confused Sir Fran and Bacon appeared. Fran had lost his usual armor and weapon, appearing in some sort of elegant tuxedo. Bacon, his calm, piggy self, had a cute little bow tie around his neck. I see, Brad said after a moment as a chair appeared for him to sit. The next window showed a smaller version of Wine, who had a beautiful black cocktail dress on and actual legs. Her hair trailing back into the shadows behind her chair. She smiled, holding up an ornate fan that had a bloody red sunset on its surface. Delta... It's only been a day since you consumed the pest. I shouldn't be surprised. Byam smiled mischievously. Jennigan was gone and appeared on a uh, booster seat in the final window. A top hat on his dragon skull. Three windows were made across them, showing Farrah, Muffet, and Lord Mushy in attendance. Lord Mushy was his usual royal regalia. Muffet had a ghostly white dress around her body. And Farrah... Vera wore a giant puffy pink ball gown and had a massive powdered wig on her head along with a cherry red lipstick. Delta stared, but then it clicked as Vera reached under the dress and pulled out a massive bottle of spirits, throwing one to Fran. The bottle sailing across the room easily before she uncorked her own. Only Vera would wear the most ridiculous things to smuggle contraband into the ball. Delta quickly pulled open a new window to see what she had accidentally done. Hot, blooded ballroom. A massive dance hall that allows all to enjoy the elegant politics of ballroom dancing or a rough and tumbling fun of doing the worm with the surprise guest's appearance from Bob. The room has different functions depending on the event. The four bosses are always able to attend, even if defeated, but lose all combat power. The other windows will have random guests from all around the dungeon, so the adventurers better hope they were kind to the one random goblin or frog. Competitions can be held or general party mode can be activated. Any outsiders who use the entrance door are put under a condition they cannot kill. Same for monsters in attendance. Usually they cannot leave the hall, but unique ballroom parties may extend to the garden beyond. Adventurers who challenge this room must dance to the satisfaction of the selected theme, be it robot, pop, or romantic waltz. Doing all the challenges and intentionally doing poorly simply to get any gift will activate King Jennigan's consequence ability. Upgrades. Unlock metal mosh pits, rave parties, and kid bop themes. O2 album automatically added for free. You cannot reject the O2 album. Just accept it. 10 DP. Panic at the Disco, unlock a special event where dance machines are spawned. Insane footwork needed, but the prizes are much better. 20 DP. Phantom of the Opera. Unlock a special mini boss event, transforming Maestro into the ballroom phantom, able to challenge adventurers who attack the judges. 25 DP. I might have done something, Dalter admitted, and she was spun in surprise. Sir Maestro, a waltz, please, Doctor said pleasantly, as he managed to hold Delta's hand, her avatar becoming stronger by the day. Aren't you supposed to ask a lady to dance before you sweep her off her feet? Delta asked, relaxing as Maestro spun his cane. This one is dedicated to all those foxy boys and girls out there waiting to shake their money makers. Delta's grandest ballroom is open for business. The greatest show is here, he announced making the music flow from the marble pillars as Delta was led away by Doctor. She laughed as he spun her under the twinkling lights of the sky. A moment later, Doza stepped forward, taking over as the judges all applauded politely. Delta laughed as she was spun around and around. She felt a little like a princess. She couldn't wait to share the speeding with everyone, Dio, Quis, Rudy, and everyone. Everyone deserved to feel like a princess. High above, unseen by anyone, unless they were looking, the Grand Royal Court of Spiders all gossiped and chatted elegantly in the web seats. Nearby, Maharia looked down, 
a little sadly as the ballroom was fantastic, but there was just enough hints of her home ballroom to make her quiet. Kui, easily the largest of the seated spiders, made awkward gestures with his hands. No, I don't want a cough drop, Maharia muttered. I said, you sound sad, he replied curtly. Maharia wanted to speak a dead language to him and make him feel like she did. Stupid. But you weren't far off. You're improving rapidly, Kui said. A silence settled over them as Dalta dotted on, favored by all her monsters, acting as though nothing had happened between her and Maharia. Was it spite or just normal for Dalta to abruptly move on with her life? I pretend not to remember, he announced, and Maharia gave him a look that she had said no clue what he meant. Before I was me, I was another. I was her. She was not a nice person, or really a person, so to speak. For Dalta, the great mother of us all, I don't want to burden her with the knowledge that I remember being broken down, burned by her rage. However, I know what it is somewhat like to feel like you are in chains without any manacles or iron links. You feel alone, an outsider, like it'll all come crashing down. Kui said quietly. How can you not hate this then? Maharia asked and Kui thought about it. Because when I was reborn, I saw who I was through the eyes of a new person. Dalda was utterly in her right to destroy who I was, and it would be her right to not return me. But she did. She saw something in me worth saving, I suppose, and that makes me feel more positive towards Dalta and who I was. I feel good being here. It's that simple, Kui shrugged after speaking. Simple, Maharia repeated, spreading her wings in thought. She looked down at Delta, bringing some of Tortog back, even if accidentally. Perhaps simple, but Maharia would struggle with her reality for some time. But for now, she'd simply enjoy the music and her fur companion, Kui's company. At least the half-spider monster was sophisticated and mature. Rhea, look, look, it's Maestro, Gui abruptly gushed, squealing as he nearly hopped out of his chair. Mahari was tugged forward with blinking eyes. A uh, singing mushroom man, yes, I, I see him, Mahari responded dryly. Gui looked scandalized. That is the supreme star of the dungeon, the singing darkness, the gentlemanly spectre, the voice of a thousand songs, it's Maestro. Gui bellailed his arms in disbelief at her lack of interest. Maharia thought about it. He ravaged me and my supreme forces with his powers and a bunch of mushrooms and spider fusions. Then he multiplied by three and surrounded my gaping dragon. She mused aloud, thinking back. Ah, jealous, Gui muttered. He was coming to kill me, Maharia reminded him flatly. Kui sighed in a daydream-like tone. What a way to go, he agreed. Maharia looked away in disgust. Boys, spider boys, and their stupid crushes on singing mushroom men that could be giant piles of spiders and mushrooms. Now, if it were Wyatt, there'd be a figure to admire. Strong, scary, commanding. Now that was a death. They both sighed, oblivious. To the other. End of 